All right, we're back. This 4 o'clock hour continues. Joined by Jeff Howell. Longhorn Blitz on the horn in, in Austin as well. And he joins us on Sikkim 365 Radio, 365 Sports. Of course, the, you, the news yesterday, Quinn Ewers has decided in the transfer portal to commit to Texas, play at Texas, where he was originally committed and then went to Ohio State. Jeff, thanks for your time. How big of a deal is this? And we've seen what were supposed to be big deals at quarterback go to Texas, and some have, Vince Young among a couple of others. What does this mean? And, and how do we know he's actually going to end up being as good as everyone thinks? Yeah, Smokey, thanks for having me. Um, for, before we, we get started, I, I caught uh, a good chunk of, of John McClain on with you guys a minute ago. And, you know, I, I for, for those that don't know, yes, I cover Texas right now. I've been doing it for about the last 10 to 15 years. But before that, there was about a three-year run where I covered Baylor. And even getting to be around Dave Campbell for, you know, three years at, at men's basketball games or football games, um, I, I've been trying to find the right word, the right sentence to, to sum up what that, little stint in my career meant to me just getting to be on the same beat with him and I thought John McClain said it just just honor honorable I I don't know that I've ever met or will meet anybody in our business or or maybe in in life period uh just as honorable as Dave Campbell so uh, I don't I don't my thoughts and prayers and I I share the same sentiment with uh our family at the Horn uh and Horns 24-7 our thoughts and prayers go out to to Dave Campbell's family uh to to the Baylor family to the Waco community uh we lost a titan in our business uh, and a gentleman uh, period with Dave Campbell. Um, so just wanted to, to, to mention that, um, sure, but you know, Smokey, as far, as far as Quinn Ewers goes, you know, I, I went looking at the numbers and, you know, Colt McCoy signed with Texas in that recruiting class in 2005, which when you looked at it with Colt and Quan Cosby and Roy Miller, uh, it was a 15 man class pound for pound. It was probably the best class Mac Brown ever signed. And since then, up through, you know, the two guys they'll sign Wednesday when Quinn Ewers, his son, filled and delivered, and, and, and Malik Murphy, the, the four-star quarterback out of California, the same. And Texas has signed 22 quarterbacks, not counting Ewers and Murphy. Uh, and only one of those 22 was a multiple-year starter, just took the job and didn't let it go, and that was Sam Ellinger. So Texas has been down this road of getting quarterbacks before, and there's a lot of guys that didn't pan out for one reason or another. I think the reason why you're so excited, why Texas fans should be as excited as excited about Quinn Ewers as they are, you know, when you look at the guys in our recruiting department at 24/7 Sports, our, our analyst department, and you know, we're we're talking to college coaches and, and big time talent evaluators before we, we make these rankings. He is Quinn Ewers is, to me. For me, is Matthew Stafford, Kyler Murray level, just in terms of his arm talent, his ability to flat throw the football. I think if you watch him, you know, the release will probably remind you a little bit more of Phillip Rivers than those other two guys. But you talk about guys that have come out of this state that can just flat out fling the football. He's comparable with those two guys. I think it's kind of those three guys for me. Um, you know, the one thing that you don't know about Quinn Ewers and nobody knows is once he's under the light and there's 11 guys at the Power 5 level on the other side of the football that have planned all week to take his head off and make his life miserable – how is he going to react? Now, he got one heck of an apprenticeship, what, what turned out this year, being a red shirt at Ohio State and sitting behind C.J. Stroud and getting to learn how to play quarterback at this level and processing all of that under Ryan Day. But this is where you're counting on that natural talent combined with Steve Sarkeesian's track record of developing quarterbacks uh, that hopefully he's the kind of guy that can get you to a point that if the rest of the roster is right and you get yourself in a position in the next two to three years to win at an elite level, that he's the kind of quarterback that you win at an elite level with. Jeff, what does this mean for Hudson Card and or Casey Thompson? I think, Paul, this means kind of this is Sark basically protecting himself from one or both guys transferring. And I think even before Quinn Ewers was a possibility, um, a Folks we talked to behind the scenes, I think Stark was working under the impression that one of, if not both of those guys, would hit the transfer pool. I mean, he was pretty blunt, as blunt as he's been about anything publicly with us uh, after the season, as soon as the K-State game was over, saying, look, that quarterback position, yes, we know Texas had other issues on offense, but he just felt like that quarterback position did not play at the level that that team needed to play out for them to be as good as they could be last year. And, again, there were a lot of things that went into that, but he made it pretty clear they were going to look to upgrade the quarterback position. And, and even even now, Paul, and you know, I'll get back to Casey Thompson-Hudson-Card in a second, even now, 
I think you'll still see Star kick the tires on veteran quarterbacks in the transfer portal just to make sure that they're not left wanting at that position. He's not leaving anything to chance. They know, look, the transfer rate for blue chip quarterbacks, even before you factored in the portal and one time transfer. There was about a 50% transfer rate for blue chip quarterbacks once they got on the campus within their first one to two years. Um, so you got, you figure a couple of these guys, even the, your projected quarterback room aren't going to be here by the time the 2022 season starts. So he's still going to look at that. But I think at this point, the writing is on the wall. If, if you're a Texas fan, uh, hoping that your, your quarterback room in 2022 includes Quinn Ewers, Casey Thompson, and Hudson Card, the reality is that's just not going to happen. I think this means one of, if not both of those guys, will be gone by the time the season starts. Jeff uh, had some players announce that they were coming back, uh, Keandre Coburn and DeMarvion Overshone and Deshaun Jameson, and, and I might be missing one or two names there, but what does that mean for Texas moving forward and into next year? I think, Craig, I think the the, big, the biggest of those three is Overshone. You know, Jamison kind of had an up-and-down year, and, and I think the good thing with him coming back is if he would if he'd have bailed, uh, Texas would have been in a world of hurt in terms of cornerback depth. I mean, it basically would have been Jade Barron, Keaton Crawford, and then a bunch of guys that haven't played in spring ball. So at least you get a veteran presence back with Jamison. And, and you know, Coburn, you could say the same for Coburn, but Texas is a little bit deeper on the interior defensive line. Now, I think when you look at Overshone, you look at the best defenses in the Big 12 this year, and you look at it and look at it, you know, the coaches' picks for first team all conference. That's so Malcolm Rodriguez, it's Terrell Bernard, it's Mike Rose. Right now, in, in, in the space and pace era of football, the better defenses in the Big 12 have elite level linebacker play. And even when you look in the last decade, even though Texas has had some historically bad defenses, when they've been really good, what's been the one common denominator? In 2011, they had a linebacker group of Jordan Hicks, Keenan Robinson, and Emmanuel Acho, three guys that played the National Football League. 2014, Jordan Hicks was an All-American. 2017, you might have had the fastest linebacker tandem in the country in Malik Jefferson and Gary Johnson. Uh, and when Texas hasn't been good at linebacker, we've seen the results have reflected that on the field. So I think DeMarvin Overshone returning, and keep in mind with him, you know, two years ago, or you know, in going in the spring of 2020, everything got canceled because of COVID. That's when he was making that transition from safety to linebacker. So he basically lost the entire off season trying to make that transition and had to do it on the fly. And then going into last spring, he had a shoulder surgery and missed the entire off season. wasn't back until they were in the summer workouts. So this is going to be really his first off season to be available to go through the winter workout program, to be available to go through linebacker drills and spring ball and really get to learn the nuances of that position without having to do it on the fly. So I think not only does it help him in his journey to play in the National Football League, but it's going to help this Texas defense. And the only chance they have to have better than average linebacker play was for him to come back. And now you hope that he is coming back. Now he can get on that upward trajectory and give you one of the better linebacker presences in this league. All right, Jeff, I, I want to try to phrase this question, and it's not to be uh, – well, for a place that has everything, obviously not in the last decade. They've, they've struggled, we know, as far as wins and losses. But for, for a place that has everything, what we hear about the University of Texas, it seems like as about the time they're the most fragile, something happens where things are dumped in their lap. For example, the Baylor scandal. In this case, Quinn Ewers transfers, and among other things as well. Lincoln Riley leaves. Lincoln Riley leaves. <laughs> does that make any sense without trying to be too critical about it? No, I was actually thinking about that the other day because I was looking at the 2016, you know, I was looking at just uh, – somebody asked me about receivers. You know, what was the, what, what's been the best receiver Hall Texas at? I started looking at 2016, and I'm like, well, you already had Colin Johnson and Lil Jordan Humphrey committed. I'm like, but – People look at Devin Duvernay on paper as a 2016 signee, but it took a lot of events for him to get to Texas if you think back that far. So, no, I mean, and can you look at other, I mean, whether it's coaching changes or uh, coaching instability, I mean, the guy I just mentioned, like, think about how big it was for Texas to get Malik Jefferson, right? If you go back to his recruitment, if Kevin Sumlin had just been able to tell him something other than, I don't know what I'm going to do for my defensive coordinator position, Malik Jefferson would have been an Aggie. So all these different, and they were in the middle of making a, a coordinator transition. So there's a lot of things that just when it seems like it's the darkest, there's some good fortune that falls on this program. Now it's all about, can Steve Sarkeesian take this good fortune 
and do something with it. I do think, and I don't know, Smoke, maybe this is me being naive, but it does sound like the administration is 100% behind Steve Sarkeesian. They're going to give him time to kind of do this tear down and, and tear it down with the studs and rebuild it. And if he does have time, which, you know, for some fault of their own, some fault not, Charlie Strong and Tom Herman didn't get ample time and, and good circumstances to do this. Uh, if he does have that time, you feel like now with the way they're recruiting, especially at those key positions, at quarterback, along the offensive line, along the defensive front, now if you're a Texas fan, now you hope, okay, if he's got time, maybe you can see this thing through to the end, and then maybe you can finally get back on track to where, you know, are you going to have the run Mac Brown had and, you know, from 01 to 09 where you won, you know, 100 plus games and won a national championship and played for another, maybe should have played for another? I don't know. But you've got a chance now if you can see this thing through to definitely leave, you know, five and seven seasons in the rearview mirror. Down to the rivet seems a pretty interesting thing for Texas, Jeff. I, I was just thinking about you saying that and, and to even have part of the powers that be admit that that needs to happen has at least got to be a, a minor step forward. Yeah, Paul, because I think as you look at it, that's been the biggest problem with Texas. I think whether it's at the administrative level, uh, at the donor level, at just uh, you know your casual fan level, I-, I think there hasn't been a lot of man in the mirror type moments where you look and take an honest assessment. And, and I think us that follow the program have been guilty of this too, taking an honest assessment of the program and realizing where you are and what needs to happen. And, and I've said this on my show, I've written about it on the site. That to me is the biggest difference between Texas and a program like Baylor. Now, granted, Baylor has had situations where you needed to tear it down it was required to kind of tear things down and, and build it back up and talking about you know that transition from from our browse to, to jim grove for a year and then the matt rule but baylor was honest about where they were what they needed to do the kind of coach they needed to hire that could do it the right way and they let matt rule do his thing and in turn have let dave aranda do his thing and now you, you, we see what baylor has done what the what the, the fruit and what the tree is has born in terms of the fruit. So Texas really hasn't done that. I think Texas has looked for the quick fix and you've kind of tried to, well, maybe if you, you know, you change out coordinators or you make these wholesale changes in the middle of these rebuilds and nothing has worked. You know, guys, at, at the point, I, I don't know. I mean, if you do see coaching turnover at Texas this off season, I think maybe you see uh, maybe a couple of position coaches move on and do something else, but I don't think there are going to be wholesale changes after a losing season. And to think about that, I mean, seasons like this at Texas in the past, you're turning over almost entire entire staff, if not just a complete regime change. So it is a nice little change of pace. Because I think for the first time in a long time, Texas is looking in the mirror and taking a really honest assessment of where they are, where they want to go, and what it's going to take to get there. Jeff, in terms of uh, those changes, while, while nothing major is expected, uh, Gary Patterson, there sure is a lot of smoke surrounding him and, and conversations. I've seen various reports, including from, from Horns 24-7, about you know uh, talking the last couple weeks or whatever the case may be. What's kind of the, the thoughts there, the expectations there, and how much uh, of this smoke is actually fire? Yeah, Craig, I, you know, I, I, my, my line is on the report. I'm still not 100% sure what to make of it. What, what I can tell you is this. Gary Patterson is really intrigued from, from the folks I've talked to close to that situation. He is really intrigued about helping Texas make this transition into the SEC. You know, he's got a, a ties to a lot of money folks at Texas. His wife is a Texas alum. They're really close with the Lost Odds. Obviously, there's the relationship there with Gary Patterson and Chris Conte. He's really intrigued about that aspect of it. What we've been trying to figure out is, okay, what does that look like in terms of his role? Mm-hmm. And I've been told straight up, point blank, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. He doesn't want to be kind of the traditional analyst role, you know, like Nick Saban has his army of analysts, but he also doesn't envision himself coming over and taking over for Pete Kwiatkowski and being a defensive coordinator or even a co-coordinator. Now, he has met with Steve Sarkeesian. We reported this morning that as early as Thursday, he could be back in Austin meeting with the defensive staff to kind of see what the fit is. I'm working under the impression, Craig, that if Gary Patterson winds up in Texas, it would be in a similar role to the one Jerry Kill had at TCU the last two years where I think the title was special assistant to the head coach, uh, the head coach of the offense, something along those lines, where basically you're doing everything 
that within the NCAA rules you're allowed to do as a non-member of, of the, the 10 full-time assistant coaching staff. Uh, you, you obviously can't call plays on game day. You can't coach players on the field. But basically you've got oversight of every aspect of football on that side of the ball. You know, you can make recruiting suggestions, break down tapes, scouting reports, the whole deal. You're, you're kind of in the foxhole with the coaches. You're just not you're not out on the road recruiting and you're not involved in, in sending in signals on game day. So it sounds like it would be kind of almost a CEO administrative type role, if you will, if Gary Patterson were to end up at Texas. But I, I think this meeting, if it does happen on Thursday or Friday, um, that meeting is really what comes out of that in terms of what information we get. I, I think at that point we'll figure out, okay, does this thing really have a chance to happen, or was it just, hey, you tried to make it work and it didn't? But I think at this point, when you look at this Texas defense in 2021, historically one of the worst defenses in school history, I think, again, this is Steve Sarkeesian saying, look, I'm willing to not leave any stone unturned to try to fix this defense going forward. And you just, you, you, you know, Texas, we knew they were talent deficient in some areas, but for you to be as bad as they were, I don't think anybody, including Stark, found that acceptable what happened last year. So I know they uh, got a couple of offensive line commits, and I guess you know we could get into the weeds of, of recruiting and individual guys, so we can just save that for, for another offseason talk. But, uh, Jeff, as somebody who formerly covered Baylor, as you mentioned earlier, uh, what's it like on your end to see – uh, you mentioned like the breaking down to the rivets and all that, but to see them doing what they're doing now with Dave Aranda after Matt Rule, after Art Browse, et cetera, is it just kind of crazy to you that they're still hanging around? Yeah, because, you know, forever and kind of growing up in that Central Texas area, you know, seeing there were a lot of times that I, 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 don't, I hope Baylor fans don't lose sight of this. There were a lot of years there were Baylor hired the wrong guy and guys that just were not the right fit for the program. And, I think to get a guy like Matt Rule, who, in my opinion, is one of the best talent evaluators and developers in all of football, uh, and then Dave Aranda, I know you guys have sat down to talk to him. I mean, he's a, just a, a really bright, engaging guy that really understands the game of football and the mechanics of how it works. There's not a lot of flash or disaster, but, I mean, you're just hiring really good football coaches, and I think that's what Texas has to get to. And, and, and it's all about fit. You know I mean? In, in my lifetime of coaches that Texas has hired, you know, the only one that really fit was Mac Brown. I mean, other guys, whether it's John McAvick or Tom Herman or Charlie Strong or David McWilliams, for one reason or another, guys just haven't been really good fits. Uh, you know, is Sark a fit? I, I think we'll find out. There's a lot of there's a lot of things that tell me, yes, he is a fit. But you know, the bottom line is, I think it just shows you whether you're talking about the, the situation Texas has been in for the last decade or kind of where Baylor is now in, in this run of success that they've had. We can talk about, you know, your, what kind of city you're in, the conference you're in, this, that, and the other. The bottom line is, are you hiring the right guy, and are you giving that guy everything he needs to make it work? And I think unequivocally, Baylor has done that with, with Matt Rule and now with Dave Miranda. Thank you, man. Appreciate your time. We'll get you again. Uh, National Signing Day. The first one is Wednesday. Jeff Howell, 247. Also, the, the uh, Longhorn Blitz and on the Horn in Austin as well. Yeah, Horn's 24-7. The site uh, for you Texas fans probably already know about it anyways, but uh, Jeff does a great job. And yeah, that was massive news with Quinn Ewers. I mean, I, I was expecting Texas the entire time. I mean, that's where he was committed a year ago before making the decision about Ohio State and then, you know, the NIL deal and all of that. And, uh, you know, when it came out that he was already reopening his recruiting and I saw Texas Tech and TCU, I just I mean, all due respect to those programs, I never thought for a second he was going there. So this is this was no surprise when he made his announcement. And you know what? They do seem to find a way. It's like The Undertaker, you know, when they're dead, all of a sudden they just rise back up. And it's, you know, getting a commit from Quinn Ewers or it's Gary Patterson possibly joining the staff or it's getting two offensive line commits when they desperately need offensive linemen. So, yeah, I mean, I think you look around the Big 12 guys and – I think that makes it that much bigger of a deal that Baylor won it this year because everybody's retooling now. And, and this is what happens every offseason. But I think you're really looking right now at like the moves that are being made and the kind of the way that the landscape's shifting. And, you know, it's, it's a lot of uncertainty out there. But for them to go in a year where there was so much and to go and just get it done and finish it and, and be that team on top at the end, I think was a massive deal for them and, and really helps carry them into an offseason where you're going to see Texas and Oklahoma and all these make big splashes uh, but you can just look back on that championship and say, like, yeah, we, we've already done that, and, and that's where we're planning to stick around. But it's going to be a fight. Yeah, with Quinn, it was pretty simple. He went to 
Ohio State instead of Texas because he didn't like Tom Herman anymore, and Tom Herman was getting fired or whatever. Uh, and then he went to Ohio State early because of the money uh, with the NIL deal because of the UIL, and then when that becomes no longer a problem, you just go back to where you really want to go. Yeah. The time. Did you see uh, Sonny Dykes' comments on Quinn Ewers? Said he wouldn't fit? Yeah. That was interesting because Sonny wasn't even meeting with him. It was yeah. his assistant coaches met with him because of the timing issue uh, where Sonny couldn't be a part of the conversation. But, yeah, he said after the fact that Quinn wasn't a fit. Now, I don't know you know what he means by that, but there's a lot riding on this young man's shoulders. I mean, he's already made, what, a million-plus dollars or apparently made a million-plus dollars and hadn't even you know played, uh, basically. So, uh, yeah, that'll be interesting to see. But uh, this is the offseason. Everybody's going to get their hype train rolling. You know what I mean? Doesn't matter what happened this past season. It's all about now. It's, it's on to the next one. Uh, so, yeah, Texas is, is drumming that that hype up. And, you know, Oklahoma landed a big quarterback commit. Brent Venable's getting his first big pledge. So, going to be very interesting to kind of see this uh, this jam-packed offseason and how it all unfolds. All right, when we come back, Kendall Cal covers 